So you really had to go and read through the paper and the discussion to really get a sense of what they were doing. And then they would conflate their findings from this two-year period with 2022 and 2023, which was really also really problematic because that data doesn't exist, really. Because they were, in order to do their analysis, you needed the mining map data from Cambridge. And that mining map data is just a distribution of hash rate across the entire globe countries. Mm -hmm. And that comes from IP addresses that Cambridge gets from participating mining pools. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Nichols, and today I'm joined by Margot Pies to discuss her latest piece for Bitcoin Magazine, debunking an article published by the United Nations University. And this report that she debunks is uh, lobbing some dubious conclusions about Bitcoin mining and its environmental impacts. So really appreciative of the work that Margot has done around this, and we're excited to jump in. And just for a little bit of background, Margot is a fellow at the Bitcoin Policy Institute, and she has done a top-notch job of pushing back against some of the motivated anti-Bitcoin FUD or faux environmental narratives which have permeated the space over the last few years. Um, and, uh, you know, this is known to some, but it all seems to be coming back to one specific Dutch central bank employee. I won't name any names for now, but we'll, we'll get there, certainly. Um, but Mario is a wealth of knowledge in the space, and she is currently a PhD candidate in the civil engineering program at Georgia Tech. And today we're going to be doing a deep dive on data center modeling methodology and where the UN University goes astray when trying to understand Bitcoin and its energy usage profiles. So all that said, uh, without further further ado, uh, Margot, welcome to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. How are you? Thanks. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Of course. Yeah, we're really looking forward to diving into this today. And um, I'll have this piece down by, by Margot down in the show notes. But um, Margo, you wrote a piece for the Bitcoin Policy Institute that was a bit more academic in nature, debunking some of the claims put out by the United Nations University recently. And then you wrote an abridged version from Bitcoin Magazine. And, and reading the latter, I'm like laughing to myself hysterically the whole time just because of how frustrated I can uh, tell that this this FUD makes you feel. Um, <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so for, for context for people... Um, Margo wrote this piece called Brandolini's Law in Action, Analysis of the UN University's Bitcoin Mining Commentary, shows the study is poorly designed and leads to dubious policy recommendations. Um, and I think that really like we, what we can start with is what, what is Brandolini's Law? And uh, that might explain why you're here today, having to take the time out of your day to to debunk some some nonsensical uh, claims. So um, with that, like, can you tell us a little bit about Brandolini's Law just to set the stage? Yeah, I mean, Brandolini's law is just this it, an internet adage, I guess, that just de it defines a law that it there's an asymmetry when you have to address bullshit. So, you know, it's like, and it was and it's actually scientific. I was there was a there was an article in Nature about it as well, talking about Brandolini's law and the importance of scientists t taking on misinformation and acknowledging how much work it takes to do that and and just the fact that it you, like for the amount of work that it takes you may not even get the same amount of eyes on it but that it's still really important to do to have those refutations and those uh you know having something out there that clarifies that there are errors with with what was originally stated that it's really important to have that out there because Hopefully somebody later on who is interested in knowing more will stumble upon something I've written or, or something somebody else has written to explain why this original claim was totally bogus. So it's uh, it's really difficult that, because, yeah, there's, there's asymmetry. It takes so much more effort. You, know, you could say a couple of sentences, and then in order to refute it, you're going to have to write paragraphs. So that, that's... That's what it felt like. It was a really torturous brain-like experiment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, and just for, for background for people, it was this uh, debunking that Margot undertook, uh, all related to the UN University, uh, the United Nations University, and this uh, piece that they published titled The Hidden Environmental Cost of Cryptocurrency, How Bitcoin Mining Impacts Climate, Water, and Land. Um, and we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this in a bit, but it just goes to show if you read through this and you've been in the Bitcoin space for a while, you see the exact same claim and the exact same citation paired it over and over again. Um, and it's really easy for people to do this. It's, it's basically they just repeat um, some talking point without very much substance behind it. And then it takes someone like Margot to go through and dig really deeply into, you know, what is the the assumptions that the modeling makes? Um, how do you explain that in a succinct way? And and all that time that goes by to take that under really shows that asymmetry between how easy it is to make bullshit and how easy it is to debunk said bullshit. Um, so, Margot, again, hats off to you for for undertaking this. Um so I, I guess I just want to start set the stage here. Um, if you can just give us a brief rundown of, of what it is the UN University was saying um, to inform our readers a little bit. And this, again, will be in the show notes. And then we can kind of move on to, you know, where you think they missed the mark. Um, so for, without further ado, just tell us a little bit about, you know, this UN University report. Right. So this was so there's actually a couple of versions of this report, which I also think is really interesting. And I think the first one that they published was in 2021. And then I think there was another in 2022. And they're both just like self-published studies. And then for some reason, somebody got an idea of like, hey, let's submit this to a journal. But then they submitted it not as a standard journal article. They submitted it as a commentary, which is a really a big distinction and which is a way to sometimes subvert a more rigorous peer review and you'll if you ever go on any of these journal websites they'll tell you that for commentaries they may or may not peer review it depending on how technical that study was so usually these commentaries are advocating for something sometimes they're just going over the literature academic literature scientific findings and then you know making broader statements about it its implications whether it's social or political environmental, you know. And in this case, it was about Bitcoin mining's energy use, environmental impact, and they went a step further than what we usually see, which is just looking and doing an energy analysis and say, oh, Bitcoin mining uses this much energy and it's the equivalent to this many houses or this country. You know, we've seen all of that. This time they decided, let's go a step further. Not only will we look at energy, We'll look at carbon footprint, we'll look at water footprint, and we'll look at land footprint. So there was three three things. So they had to use three types of basically like conversion factors to go from energy to then units that represent these other footprints like you know, CO2 equivalent, let's say in metric tons or kilograms. Then they, they used um, like area, like meters squared for land and they could have used like meter cubed for volume of water. So that was the basic idea. And, you know, it was okay, reasonable. But they, they, so they then took the Cambridge data, which is the Cambridge model that a lot of people are familiar with now. It's the Cambridge Bitcoin uh, index, con energy index consumption, I think. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. CBECI, I think. Correct. Consumption Index, yeah. So that comes out of the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. And the this model is, it's a model. It has limitations and it's been reviewed by other academics in the, the, in the peer-reviewed literature. And it's got its limitations that are fairly well known. But overall, it's still really the best model we have. And... Uh, but the authors of this UN university study really did not acknowledge that there's these limitations. So that comes into that becomes a little bit problematic because they're making very bold claims. And they were limited to a, a very short period, 2020 and 2021, in order to then make policy recommendations about the present. And the problem is that there's a lot of data missing and which is why they had to limit themselves to 2020, 2021. But because that data is missing, uh, that's really hard for them to claims that they, that they made. So 
I mean, that was, so that's basically the idea. They, they did these carbon water land footprints. They used the Cambridge model data, which is not, you know, directly representative of the real world and has some pretty strong limitations on, on the, you know, reliability and accuracy. And then they went and made very strong policy recommendations, really calling for, you know, government to crack down on Bitcoin mining in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think uh, appreciate that that synopsis, by the way. And I think what we can do here is try and um, really start from the top here and understand what it is, what is the data that they're representing, and then what the claim they're trying to make is. And so. Like you said, it seems like this UN University study is taking um, estimates from the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance from the years 2020 to 2021, and then extrapolating that forward to say, here's how much energy Bitcoin currently uses, and here's how much, you know, uh, consequentially how much uh, carbon it's emitting, how much land it's using, how much water it's using. They basically tried to extrapolate forward. Um, and reading through your response, it seemed like you really had an issue with um, that as it was presented. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like why that wasn't, um, that didn't meet your standards as far as trying to paint an accurate picture, uh, given the data that we have. Yeah. So 2020 and 2021 are a really unique period in Bitcoin in the network history, you know, price volatility, what was going on in the economic world around us at the time, it was very unique. It was a period of COVID pandemic, there's lockdowns, people staying at home. And there were stimulus checks and people were really throwing money wherever they could because they just had it and had nothing else they could do with it, you know, so, and there was a low interest rate environment. So there was a lot of things happening. It was also a bull run and that usually coincides with, you know, growing hash rate and growing price as we've seen historically. So, you know, we definitely saw a really big run up compared to the previous years as well for the bull run. So they took this very unique period and I mean, you can argue and say, well, Bitcoin, because the halving cycles are so long, they're four years, it's really hard to say, to generalize in general, like even if you go further back because the network has changed so much since its inception and it's grown so much. You know, the, the way people mine Bitcoin today is very different from what they were doing in 2011 or really even 2014. 2017, you know, the the industry has really matured in a very different way. So they took 2020 and 2021. And then not only did they take these two particular years, which were fairly unique, and they combined them into one analysis. And I think that was really, really problematic because these two years are very also very different from each other. So I tried to really show that so that, to make it obvious that it's much better to do a year-to-year -year analysis because the network is responding to so many things from year to year, depending on whether it's in a bull market or a bear market and all sorts of other factors with regulation. So you really, you really have to be careful. And I also thought it was a bit disingenuous how they presented the numbers as well, because they had figures and on the figures, they would just give one number, like, you know, I don't know, like 174 terawatt hours or something. And that was the combined number, 2020 energy use plus 2021 energy use. And of course, these numbers are estimated from the Cambridge numbers. So these aren't necessarily accurate. There's huge error bars in there. We don't really know what it, what that looked like. But usually when you look at these studies and when people are talking about Bitcoin energy use, usually you get it energy for a specific year. So like I'm talking, if I tell you Bitcoin used 90 terawatt hours, in 2020, I mean, just for one year. And for so when you looked at it, it said 2020 to dash 2021, which I think was was a bit ambiguous and made it look like it was representing one year, like 12 month, like a 12 month period mm -hmm. when it was actually representing a 24 month period. So you really had to go and read through the paper and the discussion to really get a sense of what they were doing. And then they would conflate their findings from this two-year period with 2022 and 2023, which was really also really problematic because 
that data doesn't exist really because they were in order to do their analysis you needed the mining map data from Cambridge and that mining map data is just a distribution of hash rate across the entire globe countries mm -hmm. and that comes from IP addresses that Cambridge gets from participating mining pools and they really the the number of pools or the percentage of the hash rate that is participating in this study is maybe like on average 32% or so. So that's not even half of the network. So it's, you know, so again, there's a lot of error bars there. Mm -hmm. Now the problem is, is that that data ends January, 2022. So that's the only data point we have for the year 2022, which is why they had to restrict their analysis to 2020, 2021. But they make claims as if the mining map had been updated and had been continuously updated through 2022 and 2023. Cambridge ha does not have this data. They're waiting for IP address data to come from the mining pools. And the Cambridge does not have access to the raw data either. The m mining pools mm -hmm. have to pull the IP addresses and then collect it and determine which countries all of these IP addresses came from and then give that data to to Cambridge. So that so there's they really don't have a lot of control over that. They are they don't there's no API or anything like that. It's really, I think, just like email and hey, can you guys send this to us? When will it be ready? So can... that's 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 really why it hasn't been updated. So if if Cambridge doesn't have it, these people don't have it. I don't have I don't have that data. I would have to really beg some mining pools for that data, right? So it doesn't exist. We don't know. Only the mining pools know what's going on. But they acted like they had it, and they made some claims in there. I think maybe about Kazakhstan, and it, it sounded like you know it was they had they like their information was you know up to up to the present. And, so there was a lot of that. It was very sloppy. The language was very sloppy, very unclear, very deceptive, whether intentional or not. That's how it reads. Mm -hmm. So that was really problematic. Another thing that was problematic was the, the, the type of factors, the footprint factors that they used. And I don't, I don't know if I'm going on to a second question here, but, uh, but Basically, you know, they use these emission, emissions and water and land footprint factors that were designed for evaluating generators on the supply side. So it was really about, you know, what what's the best energy producer that we could use in a given location uh, considering the limitations of that country. So for example, let's say I have a hydro plant and I have, I have it in Costa Rica. I have one or one in Par Paraguay. And I have an, a hydro plant in Arizona. Which one is going to have the most environmental footprint? It's probably going to be the one in Arizona, at least if you're looking at the water footprint, because there's water is much more scarce in that region compared to and, Paraguay. So that's why you see a bunch of Bitcoin miners moving to Paraguay and hooking up with hydro plants there and not moving to the desert in, in Southwest USA because the, you know, can't, there's not excess hydropower there. Mm -hmm. So that's really what these factors were being used for. And and what, what the authors is, they then applied it on the consumption side, on the demand side. But when you do that, you start to get some unrealistic r results or recommendations. Like if you take the next step and say, okay, well, if I reduce whatever it is that I'm doing that is increasing that demand, then that will... It will reduce my water footprint, but mm -hmm. it doesn't actually work that way. The you know, energy markets are more complicated, so it's not a one-to-one -one effect. So, so these were, so these were some of the the, the issues with the yeah. board. And they also it was just very like they only focused on to papers as their background literature review to make to to claim that there was a reason it was reasonable for them to do what they did. Yeah, yeah now I want to like double click on some of the, I guess, methodology that you think would kind of be considered best in class versus kind of how they're 
methodology differs or, or the people that they cite. Um, but real quick to kind of just summarize for the audience, I think kind of what you've said together is that um, the United Nations University is taking this data from the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. They are uh, misrepresenting it as though it were current. Um, and they're also not acknowledging the limitations of that data and assuming that it has, um, this may be an overstatement, so please can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're, they are presenting it as though um, there is very little error in terms of this data collection. So like you mentioned, the dynamic between the mining pools and the IP addresses and then the reporting of that data, there's a lot of data that, that's very noisy, most likely. So that there's there's three things is they're misrepresenting the timelines. Um, they're misrepresenting the accuracy of that data, the granularity. Um, and they're, yeah, I mean, I guess that's really like what it comes down to. And they're not making that clear in the methodology. You could run that math and, you know, say, here's this math that we did, but you need to make it clear why that's acceptable. And it, it seems as though they're trying to pass it off as, um, you know, the truth, so to speak. I mean, I, I, it seems like they're trying to make some pretty broad claims here uh, to then base policy on and which, um, you know, we, we're going to get into that a, bit, a little bit later is, you know, what do you think the policy landscape is looking like and how can we support more sensible policy and what that looks like as well? So, um, yeah, and, and I guess to go back into this dynamic between uh, how they choose to model the energy and land and water footprint of Bitcoin mining, um, I know that you have some strong opinions on, you know, what the gold standard of um, data center energy modeling looks like. And so I know our audience, you know, there's going to be variable levels of proficiency in this area, but maybe you could just walk us through, you know, some of the people that you look to when you want to try to understand this and maybe how that differs from how the UN university is basing their analysis. Yeah. So I've really learned a lot from a handful of academic researchers who have done a lot of work on data center energy use research. And those people are Jonathan Kumi, Eric Massinet, and I think, ah, uh, Armand Shahabi, I apologize, sir. <laughs> I'm butchering your name. But these guys have done this for a really long time. They've worked with the EPA and the government and um, federal government on developing studies and best practices. And so there is a wealth of knowledge out there. And it's really kind of surprises me like when you start digging into it and you're like, wait a minute, this has all happened before. I, I can pull up articles online about data centers over the last decade and l literally just replace data center with Bitcoin mining and it would be the same story <laughs> mm. for that, that we've heard today. So they, you know, so they saw that this was happening with data centers and there was all these ridiculous claims being made about energy use. And they went through that, analyzed them and said, okay, look, if you want to do this right, this is what you have to do. And so one of their... Their main points is that we need to do bottom-up modeling rather than top-down modeling. So bottom-up modeling is, requires real-world data collection. And top-down modeling is just like making some broad assumptions without actual data. So In Bitcoin mining, what would an example of each of those approaches look like? Yeah, so I mean, Alex DeRiza's work is a pretty good example of top down he i mean he he will like gosh let me see he has made some assumptions like based off of the hash rate energy per transaction i i know in one paper he did actually use i think like the number of chips that bitmain produced and then made like a really broad assumption based off of that. Hmm. Uh, like, you know, using the IP addresses is still kind of top down because you're inferring mm -hmm. and you're making assumptions about whether, you know, you're assuming that the miners are honest about their IP addresses, but you're not asking them directly. So it's just like a really, I think it's really like an indirect way of, of modeling yeah, so like it sounds like yeah. people are inferring, they're taking kind of these aggregate measures and then trying to infer based on those aggregates what the actual granular, um, I guess, subject level data looks like from that. Is that kind of what you're saying here? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's just like gross assumptions versus granular data, I guess, would probably be, I think, how 
I, I think of top-down modeling. It's usually like very simple, simplistic uh, assumptions around the types of machines. So you don't actually know what the machine mix looks like. So you have to make some assumptions. And that that doesn't really reveal. So it's like, okay, so let me, let me, let me, it's a little easier for me to work from bottom up. And then I think I can better explain top down. So bottom up is really, I go out there, I, I pull all the machine data. I, I query all, as many companies as I possibly can. So I query all the Bitcoin miners in the United States. And I ask them, what machines do you have in your facility right now? And they, they, they give me an inventory breakdown. They tell me the total number of machines they have. They tell me the models. So now I know the state of machine efficiency in the United States. So from then I can start building uh, a model of energy use. I can also then query them and ask them, okay, uh, what, how are you cooling your, your operation? What are you using fans? Are you using immersion cooling? And now I know what everybody is using. I know what percentage are using air cool, what percentage are using immersion cooling. And I can then calculate the PUE, which is the power usage effectiveness for that facility. So now I've got these fundamental facts about the energy use. So I can start making some claims about the energy use of Bitcoin mining in the United States using this bottom-up data. And it's bottom-up because I started from the bottom, looking at the components, all the IT devices, all the computers, all of the cooling hardware. And I can then from there add up, calculate the energy use for each facility and then for all the facilities. In opposition to that, I need to find the energy use without querying the mining companies without getting the hardware. So then I go and I look, okay, well, what's the hash rate look like? And then I go say, well, what if I make some assumptions about the machine mix? Okay, so I'll make some assumptions about that. Uh, just because I, I know that, you know, these miners, these might, you know, you know, an S9 is not profitable right now. Okay, so I'll exclude that for sure. But, you know, uh, the in the S21 or an S19 XP, whatever, maybe those those are going to dominate the network. So I'll give them more of a weight, or maybe I'll just assume everybody's using an S19, mm. and and then I will say, okay, well, now I, I have the hash rate, I have the machines, I can start working backward from there, and. I can also then make an assumption, let's say, about the PUE and say, well, okay, the average for data centers is, I don't know, 1.2. So I'll just assume that Bitcoin miners are also <coughs> 1.2 PUE. Mm -hmm. So now so now I'm working with a lot of assumptions and and I'm using broad network data to infer some to, to infer the energy use. And that's 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 the opposite. That's the top down approach because I I only have these like broad understandings of the network itself versus having all the little pieces that I can add up together to get to the energy use. Mm -hmm. And then once and then in the bottom up bottom up approach, when I want to start making projections about the future, I can then start looking at machine efficiency trends or other hardware trends or cooling trends so you know and then and then from there i can modify my equations of on the energy use at those bottom low scales to then say okay this is if i tweak demand or if i increase the efficiency of these machines then this is how it will affect energy use over time so it gives you m much more fine-tunable parameters that are more realistic if you do bottom-up. When you do that with top-down, a lot of times what people do is they take historical trends. So let's say, okay, I know how to take the hash rate and then get energy, an energy estimate from there. Okay, but let's say I look at how fast the hash rate grew in 2021 or you know during peak bull run all-time high, right? And that's going to be pretty fast. So what if I take that 
hash rate grows over time for that period and assume that the network is always going to grow that fast for the rest of its existence. Mm -hmm. That's a top down approach and leads to serious problems in these, these like really extreme projections or predictions about Bitcoin's energy use because it's, that's not really how, you know, computing works. There's, and it's definitely not how Bitcoin works. You really, cannot rely on these past trends to predict the, the future because there's so much changing all the time. Machines are changing. They're getting better. Efficiency is, is often always improving. So, you know, there's new technological breakthroughs. I mean, if you did that when people were still using CPUs and assumed that the network would grow to a hundred thousand, you know, dollars per Bitcoin with CPUs, how many CPUs would you need, right, to, for the hash rate to be able to grow and then stabilize at 100K per BTC, right? That would be a huge amount of energy use because CPUs are really energy inefficient compared to ASICs. So if you took that and you said, oh, yeah, let's just extend this out, what happens? Oh, my gosh, nightmare. Oh, we're going to use up all the electricity in the world, you know, so... So that's 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 what happens with top down approaches. That's why bottom up is is really considered the industry standard or the the standard for data center energy modeling and what should be the standard also for bitcoin mining because it's even though it's 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 unique and it's not entirely like a data center it is still a data center. It's just think that you know it's there's some unique properties that come with it. Mm-hmm. But you can you can you can take almost everything I would say from data center studies and just dump it onto Bitcoin mining as a starting point, and then tweak that, modify it as as we go, and then you know make it you know, you know considering the uniqueness of of Bitcoin mining. But it, I think it's a perfect foundation. And I don't know why I'm the only person who's <laughs> saying that <laughs> because it's just pretty obvious if you're serious about doing this research right. you, read, you would have read this, these papers <laughs> well that kind of brings me into to the next point is the state of this research more broadly or this anti-bitcoin FUD is every time I open up one of these papers they cite uh, more Camilo Mora and their students um, in addition mm-hmm. they cite Digiconomist and Alex DeVries and um, for, for people listening this, this Mora et al paper I think published in 2018 or or somewhere around there. But um, the crux of it was it made like crazy assumptions about Bitcoin mining's energy use, uh, essentially claiming uh, Bitcoin mining alone would drive global warming above two degrees centigrade, um, which was just like a an outlandish conclusion that was then refuted in the very journal in which this comment was published. But everyone who cites this doesn't go to the journal. And at the very top, you see, you know, I, I think it's something like matters arising from or basically responses to this crazy claim. Um, and so it's like you keep seeing people like the UN University don't seem to have even gone to like the journal in which this data was represented. If they w- they don't seem to even want to represent the state of the, the journal itself. They're just cherry picking this study. And so um, I don't know if you have any like strong opinions on that, but I was just I was floored to see the UN University use um, more at all as, as one of the, the underpinning points of their entire paper. Um, so I was just curious your, your thoughts on if any of that struck a chord with you. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm with you on that. I'm so, so annoyed. Like, literally, your literature review are two papers, one from Alex DeVries that also has been plenty reviewed in in other papers, and, and one that included Kumi and Massenet and another person whose last name is Lee, L-E-I, who is the first author and who's done a number, Noah Lee, I think, has done a number of papers with with Massa and Kumi, and you know it was it was a best practices. If you're going to do energy modeling for Bitcoin, there's ten points that you should hit, and and they went over degrees on. They made it really clear that this was oversimplistic, not realistic modeling. And Kumi even has a blog post from 2018 where he decimates degrees and digi slash digi economists, and then he did. I think it was Coin Shares, something like that, or Coin Center. He wrote a 2019 report where he went through a number of these energy models for Bitcoin and explained what the problems were with them. And Reese is included. So, I mean, it's all out there. 
So it, yeah, it's really irritating to see that. And then the Mora paper, like you said, there's these matters arising. There's three of them in the same journal that were published within a year or year after. And they all are very strong in saying nobody should pay attention to the findings in this study. There are some serious problems with this. And it's embarrassing that it's in a nature publication because nature really should be much better at weeding out bad studies. And this is this was not a breakthrough, like huge contribution to the literature. I would say it was totally, you know, it's really bad. It was bogus. So yeah, I was really pissed off when I saw that. And it's just it's just brushing. Like I've read so many Bitcoin mining papers over this past year. And and it's just you just realize how how bad they are and how many are that there are that are bad. And there's this new there was this new publication that was out as a preprint a couple of months ago from these authors called Sai and Rankin. That's their last names. Mm-hmm. And Rankin has has also co-authored, I think, with Kumi and Masnet at some point. I think maybe even on one of the res- the refutations that was published against Mora, he they that person might be cited on one of those papers as well. So they did this really fantastic literature review. And again, I mean, what like one of the the things that stuck that really stood out with that was that they really tore apart almost everything that DeVries did. So they really went after him. Like this is bad, bad, bad for all these reasons. Really, uh, really laid it out there. Not that his research approach is not trustworthy, and so you know, so there's like, there's this problem where these papers are being published, but they're not going back into the existing literature, and and you know, discussing what those papers showed or didn't show, and how their contrib- contribution is different from those papers, or building on those papers. And that's really problematic because you're literally starting from the beginning every time you do one of these papers. So there's no growth in the research around Bitcoin mining, especially around the energy use because of that. So yeah, really frustrating. And that was that was just one of the things when I I saw that like no you got to be you have got to be kidding. I know this is a commentary, but come on, really? Mm-hmm. You picked these two papers from 2018 as if nothing has been published since then. That was really hard. Really hard to accept that they just did that because they didn't, they didn't know any better. And I don't actually don't know what's worse. Like, Spencer, I don't know what's worse is if it's they're incompetent or if they did it intentionally because they all have degrees from very prestigious universities. It's, and then uh, if, if they're incompetent, it's like, hmm, maybe maybe those schools are, are not so good. <laughs> what are they doing giving PhDs to these people? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's definitely concerning. And as someone uh, growing up, I did uh, model United Nations and to see like the UN University just like just absolute fail at, you know, this uh, this commentary on Bitcoin mining's energy use. I was like, oh, man, like. I, I since getting into Bitcoin, I've maybe been like uh, disenchanted with regard to the the veracity of institutional claims uh, as as it relates to knowledge of things. But uh, this was just like, oh my gosh, like come on, guys, this was so so basic. You just needed to go to the journal in which the journal that you're citing and see that you were citing something that's been debunked. It's that simple. You just didn't bother to read the research. Um, so the oh, crazy thing, the crazy thing with that is that I actually think they cited one of the refutations in their paper, but totally overlooked the fact that it was saying this. The more paper is terrible. I think, if I recall correctly, might have been Q Loy or Ditmar, one of those. But I, I think I remember because I went through all of their references. They only had like five or so, and I was like, wait a minute. Wait, isn't that, that, did they really just cite that? Okay, I don't even know what to think now. This is crazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I guess, do you have any thoughts on how this happens? And kind of where my mind goes is, you know, that people see what they want to see. And I think that we're all kind of 
vulnerable to that kind of cognitive bias? Do you think it's a case of that or is it something much more concerted where they know what is likely true, yet they decide to push a narrative for a very particular reason? Um, so I'm just curious, like, how does this keep happening? Like, I, I'm just very disappointed because as someone who's an environmentalist myself, I see that Bitcoin can be a great net positive for so many of these goals that align with other people's environmental goals that aren't into Bitcoin, yet they don't seem to want this assistance. And I, I don't understand. So like, what what's going on here? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of times, I mean, if we have to remember scientists, researchers are just people too. They watch the news like everybody else. They are often, you know, they're, the way they view the world is very much formed by where they get their information. And, you know, it's no secret that a lot of scientists are in the liberal camp and they do watch a lot of CNN and MSNBC. So they get very mainstream narratives delivered to them. That's what they take in. And that's, and you get that kind of person in academia for a variety of reasons. There's a certain type of person who can make it that far. And it's usually somebody mm -hmm. who's going to conform to society and not really stick out and not make waves because it's such a brutal process to get to the PhD and to get into academia as a professor and then to get the, you know, to get tenure. It's brutal. It's brutal and it's soul crushing and there's all sorts of, you know, political things going on. Mm. So yeah, so they tend to, you know, tend to be more, you know, mainstream liberal, CNN, Emerson, BC consumers, I would say, you know, upper middle class type. So they're going to have a really unique viewpoint and and they're the type of people who have been strongly targeted with the message that bitcoin is bad it's evil it's money laundering it's burning the planet and i think that they do have some unconscious bias against bitcoin when they approach the research or what they're willing to accept even as legitimate research i think that can be a little bit of a challenge but then you have on the other hand you have you do have people who are trying to weaponize the peer review process to legitimate, legitimize their claims to, to actually enact certain types of policy. And uh, I see that happening, and I think that's really dangerous. And I've seen stuff, I, you know, I read this study that was published, and, it, it, and in the end it acknowledges people from Change the Code, and it also acknowledges some people from the mining industry as well, which I thought was, was interesting. And, and it was, I think one of the authors was from the Tony Blair World Institute or something like that, whatever his nonprofit is. And, you know, that's Tony Blair is a war criminal who's got his own agenda for how he thinks the world should be. So, yeah. So I thought, I thought, okay, this is clearly published in whatever journal because there is a certain kind of policy that they want. To see happen that was that seems pretty obvious this one i mean there are some really strong policy recommendations that were made that were pretty harsh and very much against the network and you're referring point. to the un university study right now right yeah yes so for the un university study i i'm i mean I would rather say that they, that this was done intentionally because they wanted to get a certain, they were making use of the peer review process so that they could have some journal article that they could use to defend their position on their policies, you know, to policymakers. You know, I, I would rather that be the case because the opposite is that they're totally incompetent and Yale and, you know, University of Michigan and Carnegie Mellon look should be embarrassed that they gave PhDs to these people. So <laughs> I'm going to hope that they're actually good researchers who just chose to be political and do a political statement through this commentary, knowing that they're, they were cherry picking and purposely conflating things and, and making information results a little ambiguous. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure which outcome I'd prefer. <laughs> is it malice or incompetence? And I think I'm going to put that uncomfortable thought out of my mind for now. I know I've been on to kind of the perils of uh, institutional aggregation of knowledge and dissemination. Uh, it happens. But, 
it, yeah, it's um, that's a whole uh, rabbit hole maybe for another time. But I kind of want to yeah. touch on the policy recommendations and also kind of get your opinion on you know the policy landscape as it relates to Bitcoin mining and energy use. Um, I know you work closely with BPI as a fellow there. Um, and then, you know, what recommendations you might like to see? And I, I don't necessarily, you know, you don't need to have like a whole master plan ready. Um, but if, you know, maybe there are some things where you would say, hey, we should explore this more as an option that would benefit um, like a variety of systems that c connect with Bitcoin mining. But um, yeah, first of all, like what are these policy recommendations that the UN is trying to make? And then we can kind of just take a look at those and, and see, you know, how stark and uh, pretend, I mean, based on what you've said, very misleading they are. Ooh, let's see. I may have to go back to the paper. <laughs> let's see. <laughs> because uh, I don't really remember now. I'm trying to fix this. I was trying to erase this from my memory, but I guess I can't. I mean, they were like, at some point, you know, they were saying uh, proof of work should be switched to, to proof of stake, which is a common one that we've heard. And another one, they were claiming that there is environmental it's like social environmental justice issues with Bitcoin mining because of the water use or land, you know, the environmental footprint could be harming marginalized people. You know, they made these like these huge leaps in their claims without actually citing evidence for them. Like they said, unregulated and untaxed mining activities exacerbate the inequality in these areas and have lasting environmental impact. No citation for that. Their study, the methods that they chose, the results that they have to, are not foundational for these claims. And there's nothing in the literature that they've cited that shows this connection. I mean, even DeVries at least has tried, has, has some paper out there where he claimed something about how Bitcoin was hurting poor people. So like they could have at least thrown that in there, but they did it. And they, you know, they're just saying it's unchecked growth. Okay, how do they know it's unchecked growth? They don't know because they they only looked at 2020 and 2021. They don't know how the network works. They don't know what, how the protocol works. They don't know what dif how the difficulty adjustment works because they never mentioned it. So they don't know what the constraints of the network protocol are on on the energy use. And uh, and so they so there's no way that you can you can make these claims that there's this unchecked growth because we don't actually know. There's nothing in the literature that says really one way or another in a systematic way. So they they said they were advocating for immediate policy, technologic, and scientific interventions to mitigate this trans, these transboundary and transgenerational costs with major environmental just injustice implications. So like these are like really extreme attacks on on Bitcoin on the on the mining industry really really saying that it's not only you know it's not only is it harming us when it comes to climate change it's harming us in our water it's harming us on our land and it is harming harming the most vulnerable people in the world Bitcoin is just got to be the most dangerous thing that could ever have been created that's going to really destroy the planet hurt people you got to regulate it. You got to tax it. You got to ban it. I mean, there's a sentence in there where it's almost like, in, you know, indirectly saying, why haven't you banned Bitcoin yet? So, yeah, it's, it's, these were policy recommendations that really are not backed up by what they did. But if you don't, you know, if you don't really understand, if they're not giving you the full picture of, Bitcoin mining of how the network works and you're a policymaker and you look at this, you're going to say like, oh, yeah, this is bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got to do something about this right away because this industry is dangerous. So then Brandolini's law comes into play and I have to write like 10 more policy reports <laughs> and try to talk people off the list. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you're able to stay busy. That's that's a positive here. Oh, and, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, certainly. But I mean, we'll have to have another podcast on this soon. Um, but yeah, I think you really clearly laid out, first of all, they are using data from Cambridge that are they are then misrepresenting and applying a faulty method, faulty methodology to. And then they are um, providing unsighted policy or unsighted impact assessments to generate 
misguided policy recommendations and all the way down it's basically this like disjointed illogical but if you squint at it in a weird way you could maybe if you weren't familiar with the material you'd be like i guess like sure but it, there's just so much to dig through first of all to understand bitcoin to understand energy modeling to understand the citations behind all of this and by the time you've gotten around to doing this they're you know out publishing another few papers that are like citing devries and mora again and again so it's like it's this crazy cycle here um but uh gosh i'm, I'm unsure where i want to take this but I guess, do you have any thoughts on where the policy landscape is going for Bitcoin mining as it relates to energy and the environment? Um, I know I, I talked to uh, Frank Holmes from Hive Digital Technologies recently, and kind of his take was with the approval of these spot ETFs, we're going to see a new lobbying arm come in as well as more legitimacy, which will kind of help push back on some of this FUD that's coming out. Um, so curious your thoughts on that, but also more generally, like, you know, how are you assessing the state of this discourse? Is it trending positively or... Um, if you could extrapolate maybe from the current condition. Yeah, I mean, the ETFs certainly add some institutional Wall Street legitimacy to Bitcoin mining because they're basically accepting it. But on the other hand, you know, the government still has the ability to say, now nah, we don't we don't want Bitcoin mining in this country, even if there's ETFs, just take it somewhere else. We don't we don't care. You can still trade it, whatever, but you want to buy Bitcoin, go ahead, buy it on Kraken, but don't put, don't set up those facilities here because we're don't, we don't want that environmental impact. And uh, I also don't, you know, I still think that there are people in Congress like Elizabeth Warren who would like to see Bitcoin heavily regulated so that only thing you can use are ETFs because that really... I think that really uh, neutralizes the power of Bitcoin, the network, what it represents, and the you know, how it empowers people on a really basic level, on a fi financial freedom level. So they can't control it, and government can't control something that's a problem for the government. Right? They have to be able to know that they can control just about everything. You know, on ramps, off ramps. We get spied on NSA. You know, they're collect all of our met metadata, right? So if they can't easily do that with our money, I think that's that's a, a still a threat and still a threat to the mining industry that I think if Congress were laid out a certain way and some politicians really wanted to score a win with environmentalists so that they can ensure that they're elected in the next cycle, it's a, you know, Bitcoin mining is still a small industry. It's an easy thing easy win for them, I think. I mean, mm. it, it, I, I think people really underestimate the narcissism and the ego and the psychoticness of the politicians who just only want to win and they just want to be in power. And they will undermine something, an industry, whatever. They'll do it just so that they can score points. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. I know this because I have a friend who works in this area and he was around when this happened in the 90s. And you might think, ah, oh, this is silly anyway. But so it was, but you know, now we're talking about UFOs. So these things, <laughs> so I guess it's not that silly. But there was a, you know, SETI, the SETI Institute, which is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It's based in Mountain View, California, it used to be funded under NASA. So it was actually part of NASA's budget. And then there was this politician one day in the 90s, like early 90s, who was like, you know what? I need a political win. I'm going to go after SETI. And he succeeded in getting SETI kicked off of the NASA budget. So SETI had to go and find, the, in order to continue, they had to find private donors. And that's how they exist nowadays. But they used to be part of the NASA budget. And that's how they did their research. And so they took something that was just just some part of astronomy, this idea, this experiment. Hey, let's just point some radio telescopes and see what we find. Let's see if we hear anything. You know, the science says it's possible. It doesn't exclude the possibility of life outside of planet Earth. So, you know, our basic, our most fundamental assumptions and understandings of the universe suggests that, you know, radio could be one way that we could detect that. 
And then this politician said, ah, no, this is the most stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I'm going to get reelected on this. Hmm. I got to show my my constituents that I did something. So, yeah, it doesn't. For, so for me, I don't I don't think anyone should feel totally safe. And think that the ETFs are going to save us or save the industry. Uh, I think that there's always challenges ahead. There is some legitimacy there, but it doesn't mean that they can't still regulate Bitcoin mining out of existence mm-hmm. by just putting some kind of energy tax on that type of use or electricity tax. You know, I think it's still possible. So, at a, at a broader level, do you think that? Um... Perhaps like over time, I guess like kind of the blips on the radar, like Elizabeth Warren going after Bitcoin mining, uh, perhaps in, you know, Greenpeace kind of doing the same, being in a similar camp. Um, Those things aside, do you find the overall trend to be increased understanding, increased and increased understanding of the value of the utility of Bitcoin mining? And so kind of where I'm going with this is like, are there institutional or are there are there lobbying factions that are kind of integrating with Bitcoin mining that you think could result in um I guess the ultimate integration of Bitcoin mining into our uh, political landscape. And so it's basically like, do you think that the incentive for people to reach for control and ban Bitcoin mining is less than the incentive for people to use Bitcoin mining in a positive way? Um, I guess I just want to know, like, do you have a positive outlook on kind of the game theory incentives um, as it relates to our political system? Um, Or are they kind of going to be at odds with one another? Um, I know that's a bit of a multifaceted question, but um, I'm happy to clarify as well if you need. Yeah, let me see. Well, I think, you know, the change the code people in Greenpeace are a good example of, I think, a win for us or for Bitcoin, at least in terms of showing that your campaign to destroy Bitcoin mining is not going to work because you know, it was dead on arrival. That's just not how it works. If you really want to change the code, go ahead and put in a BIP request, you know, <laughs> like put in a BIP and yeah, like argue your, your argue your point and get everybody to agree to change it. I mean, that's just how it works. So, you know, that, that was a big success. I, I think that they finally realized that this is not working. But that doesn't change their view that they think Bitcoin is, is still damaging to the, to the environment. And just a waste of energy. A lot of people still think that, but I, I think the benefit that we have right now is that there isn't a lot of this cycle. So so far, has not really paid too much attention to Bitcoin's energy use. There hasn't been a lot of like big stories. I mean, you know, when Greenwich, that was in 2022. Greenwich was in you know Seneca Lake, upstate New York, mm-hmm. co-located Bitcoin mining facility with a natural gas plant that used to be a coal plant. And that was all over the news. That was huge. I mean, I was seeing that on progressive talk shows. They were talking about it. It was like, whoa, <laughs> okay, this is huge. We're not really seeing that so much right now. So I don't know if that means it's just, it's not as shock value anymore, or if they're just waiting for something to find that's juicy to then start the cycle over. I don't know. But I think we benefit. I think the network benefits and the potential to do good things with Bitcoin mining benefits from that lull in the news cycle, the attention not being on Bitcoin mining as heavily. And maybe there's some fatigue amongst environmentalists. I don't know, hopefully. So yeah, I think we benefit from that. The network benefits from not too much attention. And uh, I hope, you know, I hope that continues, you know, oh, because I think there are really good things and hopefully that allows for more research to be produced and published that then shows the flip side. And we've had, you know, we had that one recently out of Cornell University that was a very simple study, you know, with some very basic assumptions that I also was kind of like, this is interesting. Why did you use heat pumps to cool your facility? Nobody uses that as far as I know, but okay. And, you know, very simple assumptions on CapEx, OpEx, Also, it didn't engage with the literature because there was another interesting paper that they should have referenced and they didn't. So, but it was a positive. It was a positive paper. It wasn't as horrible as, you know, as as the UN uh, study, right? It wasn't like 
a mess. It was very simple. They got to the point. They got to their results. The results made sense. And it showed that, yeah, you could take a lot of, you could take any of these solar farms in Texas, California, and a number of other states, and you could actually boost revenue. And they found that there were specific locations where there was a, an even greater boost in revenue for that solar or farm or wind farm site. So yeah, we need, we need more studies like that, even as simple as that one was. It, hopefully the new cycle will give us a chance in, on the research end to be able to produce more studies like that, that then show actually, you know, there are some really interesting things that, that can happen. Yeah, so no. I'm, I'm hopeful for that. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And, and fingers crossed that that can happen. And uh, I'm really appreciative of the work that you and others at BPI are doing. I think um, aside from the research, research that you're directly publishing, I think that there's just an overall dialogue that's happening and kind of a, a community building exercise that's going on there where there are people that have an interest in this type of thing in a more academic background, being able to find a place to have Bitcoin discourse, um, ask difficult questions and and really look for the truth. And um, in addition to, I think that, you know, I hope that the marketplace can also help drive people towards the truth um, or to a greater understanding of Bitcoin. Um, like you said, I think that with renewable energy projects needing Bitcoin mining to integrate in order to drive revenue, I think that my hope is ratepayers as a constituency will want to move towards supporting Bitcoin mining because they see that benefit uh, to their checkbook. And um, that's you know perhaps naive, but I would like to think that the market uh, would correct any false assumptions there. Um, but Margo, really appreciate you know everything you had to say today. It was really interesting hearing, uh, first of all, how much bullshit you had to slog through to get to this point. But I sincerely appreciate it. And uh, again, this article you wrote, Fucking hilarious and very entertaining <laughs> and, and deeply informative too. Thank you. Yeah, that was, I, I, I had to, it was cathartic. I had to do something different. I had to let it all out somehow. And I just, and that was, that was the only way I could figure out how to do it, it was just to go full on crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I really appreciate that you did that. Um, awesome. Well, is, is there anything else you want to leave our audience with? Uh, I guess letting them know where they can connect with you if they have any questions or, or any other work that you have coming down the pipe that you might want to share with our audience as well. Yeah, obviously Twitter or X. I'm on there and my DMs are open. I check them regularly. It's a good, good way to find me. I'm also on Telegram and you can find me on there as well. I'm working I'm working on a couple other policy reports for BPI. One of them is a really important one that I've been collecting data for. Working really hard on that and we should have that out in time for our summit in DC in April. That's going to be April 8th. So, uh, looking forward to getting that done, but it's a lot of work. And then I have a, a smaller policy report that I'm working on in relation to flared mining, so using flared gas for Bitcoin mining. So hopefully those be those will be out sometime by the end of this first quarter. And aside from that, I'm just working on my thesis research, which is also on Bitcoin. <laughs> so yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. That's all I do. Okay, well that that says it all really at the end of the day. Um, well, Margo, thank you so much. Uh, I really look forward to having you on the show again, and thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. Um, and again, yeah, everyone, uh, keep an eye on BPI. They're doing great work over there. I'm looking forward to seeing what y'all make down the road. All right. Thanks. Peace, everyone. All right. Thank you.